to lie, won't stop to lie, can't stop to lie, won't stop to lie, can't stop to lie, won't stop to lie, ain't no Pico, just be smooth. Welcome guys to Tech Don't Sleep Podcast. We got another one for you, an exciting episode. And as always, we love bringing you guests who can add value uh, to your life, to your business, to your professional development. And today we have Amy Harris with WIT, Women in Tech. And is it the Nashville chapter or the... We we are not affiliated with a national organization. Okay. So it is Women in Tech Tennessee. We yeah. are Nashville born and, and all local. I love it. I love it. Women in Tech Tennessee. So we're going to talk about her role, her involvement, and what the objective is for Women in Tech Tennessee. And, you know, get some practical takeaways and, and, and maybe some things you see around the corner and some insight from your involvement with the organization. Now, you are the president, right? Yes. So we were talking before we started recording, I believe, and you're from Mississippi. Yes. Now, tell the people the, the town you're from. You said you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I am from Potts Camp, Mississippi. Potts Population Camp. Population 492, the last time I read this. Oh, sign. my so, goodness. Yeah. So that's where you grew up? That's where I grew up. Okay. Yeah. So how did you get to Nashville? Oh, it was a long and winding <laughs> path. Um, so I went to college in Columbus, Mississippi, at Mississippi University for Women, okay. affectionately referred to as the W. Five. So I'm a, I'm a double W girl. Mm-hmm. Um, although men go there too, we've been accepting men um, really? since 1982. Fun fact. The W and the lawsuit that was brought against the W for a male student to be admitted there mm-hmm. was the precedent upon which the first female student um, sued to be admitted to the Citadel. So, oh wow, interesting, interesting fact. And that that um, so you guys first started admitting men in eighty two. Okay, okay, that's right. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Um, so it was it it felt very co-ed to me it, during that time. Yeah. Um, but it was clearly a women's emphasis, um, mm-hmm. was not remotely in tech at that point. Um, double majored in music and journalism. My first okay. job out of college was as a newspaper reporter in Meridian, Mississippi. Still yeah. a tiny place, but mm-hmm. a lot bigger than Potts Camp. Um, and after that, hopped over into politics and spent the next five years bouncing around the country. Worked on governor's races in Oklahoma, in Mississippi. Yeah. Worked for Democratic Party organizations in Mississippi, Maine, um, eventually started working for, you know, it doesn't take you long working in that space to Mm -hmm. find out that if you don't want your job to stop on the second Tuesday in November, Mm -hmm. win or lose, then you probably need to hop over to the consulting side of things. Mm -hmm. Um, So I got hired by a political fundraising firm and our market niche was technology leveraged and one of the partners in that firm lived in Murfreesboro and so a requirement Mm -hmm. of taking the job. I worked for them first as a finance director and Mm -hmm. then um, when they wanted to hire an operations director to kind of manage across all the the campaigns, um, they asked me if I wanted to take the role and doing that meant moving to Murfreesboro, yeah. which I did in February of 2003. So, okay. um, yeah. Are you still in Murfreesboro right now? I'm not. So okay. I, I married a unicorn, a native Nashvilleian. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. He is one of five boys, and all five of those boys are still in Nashville. Wow. So they're not boys anymore. But, yeah. Um, <laughs> there, uh, yeah. So um, we were in Murfreesboro until 2016, but we moved mm-hmm. into Nashville then. And um, yeah, we're, I'm a metro parent. And, yeah, cool. Um, now that's that is a that is a a, a winding road or journey in terms of how you got to Middle Tennessee. For so, sure. No, to tech. But it sounds yeah. fun though, because you it sounds like you did a lot of traveling. You got to see the the country. And work on campaigns and, and things like that. Probably build a lot of relationships and yes. got a lot of experience. Yeah. So how did you get, by the way, I'm a unicorn as well. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I'm a unicorn. You know, people say that, you know, they're unicorn. People were born and raised in Nashville or Middle Tennessee. And I know a ton of people. Yeah. Who were born, just because I grew up here. Of course, I know a lot of people. But uh, obviously, there's a ton of people moving there. So I get it. So how did you, uh, at what point did you get involved with Women in Tech, Tennessee? 
So it was a number of years later. I mean, that that okay. job since since our firm was kind of technology leveraged. Mm -hmm. And um, so I had to learn how to support that technology. So the managing partner in the firm, who was also a professor at MTSU, mm -hmm. where I am also a professor mm -hmm. now, um, you know, he's like, you know, it, it would be really good for you to take some technical classes mm -hmm. to, to to round out your skill sets so that you can actually do your job better. And I, I took the first one in the summer and I don't know if he came to regret it or not because I loved like <laughs> it just bit and I love mm -hmm. tech so much. And um, it was just something that I never, you know, there wasn't enough. When you grow up in a tiny town in a rural mm -hmm. community, you don't even know about tech or opportunities. Mm -hmm. You just, you can't even imagine what that's like. And when the door opened for me, um, it just felt like it was a whole new world. So I wound yeah. up going part-time mm -hmm. um, in that job for the consulting company to be a full-time student. Got my master's in information systems and analytics at MTSU. Um, maintained residency in Middle Tennessee, but did my doctorate at the University of Memphis. Okay. And then the stars aligned that about the time I was finishing up my doctorate, a faculty position opened back up at MTSU and I applied. And yeah. so yeah, I've been on faculty there ever since. And, um, and so what do you teach? What? So I am in the Department of Information Systems and Analytics. Okay. My particular focus area is business intelligence and analytics. Okay. And we um, have a master's program. I've, I've been on faculty teaching in the program um, for almost 15 years, um, became the graduate program director in May of 2020. So we've got a master's program with about 125 students okay. in it on average. Um, and so you asked me a question and now I forgot. What question was I getting? Wait, how did I get involved with WIT? So, you know, my first five or six years on faculty, it was kind of that typical path of you're just, you're, your head's buried and it's all yeah. about tenure and, yeah. you know, Publishing and you again. started there when? What what year did you 2007. start? 2007. 2007, okay. 2007, yeah. Um, and so I was super focused on that <laughs> for those first six years. And then after that, you know, you, you've been working for this goal for like so long. Yeah. Because it's really a 10-year arc from the day you start your Ph.D. program to the day you get the letter. That, you know, you've been tenured. And, you know, uh. you know, it's like this whole new chapter begins. Right. Um, but that also kind of came with a bit of a crisis for me because it's like, well, what do I do now? Mm. You know, you've been solely fixated on this goal for such a long time. Mm -hmm. um, and it was at that point that we started our family. So I had okay. my son. Um, and I will not pretend that I just didn't kind of flounder and just be like, what am I supposed to do now? Yeah. Um, but one day it hit me. It's like, you got to get out in the community. Mm -hmm. You know, you got to, you need to build relationships. You need to get off of, you know, get off campus, go out, meet people. And so I attended my first meeting for WIT in 2015, mm -hmm. probably joined um, somewhere around that same time. And then um, it just, it evolved from there. That and getting plugged into other pieces of the tech community too. Yep. I yep. think I also attended my first National Analytics Summit in 2015. Okay. Um, and Eric Stevens, the guy whose brainchild that event was, um, I met him there. And, you know, at that point in time, like that was the second or third analytics summit and it was maxed out registration at 150 people. We were all like wow. cramped into the Lipscomb Spark Center. Yeah. Um, and you could just tell it was growing. And he was, I remember him telling me like there were a hundred people on the wait list. Wow. And I was like, look, it's going to come to a point where you can't do this by yourself anymore. You yeah. Know? And so if you need, um, you need help with that, I've had some experience with conference planning. And so the next year or so he invited me to, um, to join the Analytics Summit Steering Committee, and I've been on that ever since and got yeah. to watch that scale. How big is that now? Um, our peak attendance in 2019 was um, was right at 800. Okay, wow. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we were, before the world fell apart, before, yeah. we, were, we were gunning for 1,000, and we're wow. still gunning for 1,000. Um, 
you know, it may take a little bit of time to get there. I'm actually cheering it this year, um, but that's a goal everybody wants, mm-hmm. wants that to happen. And it was really between the analytic summit and WIT, because there's a lot of cross-pollinization of people, mm-hmm, you know, sure. um, that that's when it really, really began to engage with the community. Yeah. And um, WIT is hands down the best thing I've done in my adult life. Now, how long have you been president of WIT? January. Of this year. Yeah. So, yep. Wow. So just yeah. a couple months. Just a couple basically. months in. Um, okay. So give us the, what's the purpose of WIT? What's the objective? So WIT's vision is to revolutionize the experience of women in tech okay. and to, to create a culture of, um, you know, to foster and improve inclusion and culture in in tech culture and tech leadership. And we do that through our four pillars are um, education, Mm -hmm. community outreach, networking, and scholarships. Okay. Um, And I can take a deep dive on on any one of those. (laughs) No, I was just... But that's what what we're here for. I was just thinking, uh, when you talk about, you know, women... Uh, getting traction in technology, especially in the corporate arena. Are you guys engaging, uh, I guess, corporate elite partners as well oh, to, to, to mean, have an impact? That's how corporate, we call them mission partners, okay. but our corporate mission partners are how we're funded and how we do everything that we do. WIT is really phenomenal in that we are a, an all-working volunteer board. Okay. Um, we, you know, we made the decision. I, I say we as the organization. It was made long before I was involved. That you know, we don't, we don't have an office. We don't have overhead. We don't mm-hmm. have staff. Mm-hmm. And the reason for that is because any dollars that are tied up in that. Mm-hmm are dollars that aren't going toward scholarships. We give away between thirty to fifty thousand dollars of scholarships wow. every year. Mm-hmm. Um, to you know, college students or No. To- we um that's and, and this kind of feeds into my history too. So mm-hmm. at one of the analytic summits like I want to say maybe 2016, 2017, mm-hmm. I was having a conversation with Beth Hogue, who is the um, the, the COO at Trinisys. Okay. And she was WIT president at that time. And WIT has been giving out scholarships for years, but at that point in time, they were really scaling and diversifying the types of scholarships that they wanted to give. Um, and also recognizing that there needed to be kind of better tracking of that and mm-hmm. knowing who who the scholarship recipients were, yeah. where they were going, and what their stories ultimately wound up being. And so they made a decision in mid-2017 to spin scholarships out from underneath outreach and create a, a board role for director of scholarships. And mm-hmm. when that was created, I was asked to come on board and fill that role. And so I served in that okay. role until being elected vice president and for us, you get you know elected vice president, serve two years, serve two years as president, and serve two years as as past president. That's kind of how the leadership yeah. cycle works. That's good. Yeah. Um, so, how many members do you guys have? We have about two hundred. And, and it's statewide, right? No. Or is it just Middle it's Tennessee? Middle Tennessee. Okay. I okay. Mean, we focus very specifically on on Middle Tennessee. Um, so we. I, our membership model is individually based, okay. not, you know, it's not like a company. chamber model where a company is mm-hmm. a member, you know, like it would be for the NTC. Um, so we are individual memberships plus our corporate mission, our corporate mission partners. Um, and we're just very lucky to have tremendous support from our local tech community. That's yeah. what that's what allows us to do what we do to put on our our programming um, for K twelve students to to provide the scholarships. Which we do have scholarships. We've got scholarships for high school students. We've got scholarships for you know undergrad grad students. Mm-hmm. One of the really cool things that's happened over time is as we sort of felt like. We kind of saturated that market um, of of those sorts of scholarships. It's like you know, 
there are other people who have financial needs and want to learn and want to develop professionally, but mm-hmm. they're not doing that through a degree program. Mm-hmm. So we have the the WIT Professional Development Scholarship, which is if somebody wants to, it's it's a, a benefit of being one of our members. Mm-hmm. But let's say somebody wants to sit for a certification exam yeah. and they want to attend a conference, mm-hmm. or we're pretty open. Um, just so long as it's relevant, then um, you can apply for those. Mm-hmm. Um, you can apply for those funds and get up to a thousand dollars of yeah. um, some sort of professional development covered. Wow, that, that's amazing! So, if somebody needed um, like continuing education or certification, like you said, a conference, man, that's pretty cool because these conferences get expensive. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. <laughs> I, was, I was looking. I was looking at one recently yesterday. I was like, wow, six fifty, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and that's cheap. Yeah, you know, it is. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. And especially for people who are looking to pivot into the field. Um, mm-hmm. I'm thinking of one of our members in particular who recently landed a job. She started out as a journalist <laughs> and um, has spent a lot of the pandemic transitioning into wanting to go into UI, UX. Yeah. Um, and she is actually a recipient of um, one of our professional development scholarships. Okay. But on LinkedIn, like sometime in the past month or so, I saw her post and she she tagged with it. And nice. those of us that have gotten to gotten to know her to just say, you know, I finally landed the job. Yeah. You know, everything that I've been working for for years has mm-hmm. come to fruition through this. And it's like when you see when you have stories like that, it's just like this. This is what we do it for. You know, absolutely. It's. it's pretty amazing so so question then if somebody like this example you just gave somebody she was a journalist and she wanted to get into tech what i'm sure there are different paths but what would you recommend like what would you tell somebody if they say hey i want to change careers and i want to get into tech what should i do should i go to school and get a degree you know like you did or or masters or or should i do a boot camp you know cybersecurity boot camp or something like that because i see these popping up as well yeah what's a good path that you think i mean they're all equally valid. Okay. The fact of the matter is, there's such a need for mm-hmm. tech talent mm-hmm. um, that all of our efforts, like, I don't consider it competitive of, you know, like, get a master's degree at MTSU or mm-hmm. some other college as opposed to go to the National Software School. Mm-hmm. I think everybody, all of those places are doing good work. Sure. And that we all need to be operating at full capacity to get people cranked out and make the pivot happen as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. Which one of those paths is the right path is completely situational with that person and where they are in their life. You know, not everybody has six months to Mm -hmm. be able to say, okay, I'm going to do this full time. And that's going to be, you know, that's going to be what, what I do. Um, other, you know, folks need to work. There's so many, you know, you got family obligations and some of it comes down to what you're interested in. And there might be some, you know, some subspecialties of tech where, Really, only one institution is offering what it is that you're interested in. Um, So just doing the due diligence to find out where the place is that not only has what it is that you want to study so that you can meet your passion, um, but also making it fit into your life. Because that's, you know, nobody... If the pandemic to me is taught out as anything, we are we are whole people and we need to be able to bring our whole selves into any yeah. situation. Um, so you can't just really look at the programs or the schools in isolation. Mm-hmm. You've got to look at what the person's background is, what it is, where they want to go, and yeah. what's going on in the rest of their life to get to what's going to be the right fit. Yeah, that was a that was a gr- I want to say that was a great answer, but I just <laughs> <laughs> I mean. It was a holistic answer. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because you're right. It's so situational yes. and it depends on the person, where they are in their life and what, you know, what they got going on. So absolutely. It's good. I mean, I have this conversation with prospective students almost every day. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah I bet. And that's, I think I've, I've, that's been a big lesson. It's just like, you have to, the education route has to meet people where they are. Mm-hmm. So question about women in tech period, right? So I don't know the numbers or the stats, but um, maybe you do. And and maybe you can help me understand why is there a purpose for women in tech, a women in tech organization? Right. Uh, Are women not, you know, penetrating that 
industry, the, the tech industry as much? Are there not as many opportunities? She's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, that was my assumption, but again, I just didn't, I don't, I haven't, you know, got up to speed on it. So, yeah, well, I am the numbers lady. Okay, so, okay. Right, let me, I, I will get the, let me give you some background <laughs> on another thing that's kind of come out of all of these relationships between WIT and the NTC. Um, when I first started plugging in to the Nashville tech community, I kept hearing, initially it was Brian Huddleston, who mm-hmm, was mm-hmm. At the, the, head, heading up the NTC at the time, and then shortly thereafter, um, Brian Boyer, they were always talking about, well, you know, their X number, uh, you know, I, I, the number that sticks in my head that is, there, there are 2,000 open tech jobs in Nashville, mm-hmm. 2,000 open tech jobs. And my question was, given... I'm a data-oriented person. It's like, okay, well, where, where are those numbers coming from? What yeah. does that What does that mean? And through talks with the NTC, I found that the numbers that were out there were numbers that were being produced by these national organizations like CompTIA, yeah. um, where CompTIA does a report, and it's a national report, but there's a page or two dedicated to every city mm-hmm. or, or every state. Um, and those are fine and good, and we can glean insights from that, but that wasn't enough to satisfy me it's like i think we need to be doing homegrown workforce Mm -hmm. tech workforce research and so that led to a partnership between mtsu and the ntc the middle Mm -hmm. tennessee tech research program that i'm the program director for Mm -hmm. and the primary deliverable from that since 2018 has been an annual report on the state of middle tennessee tech focusing specifically on the 14 counties that are in the nashville metropolitan statistical area so we report on um, a wide variety of, of, of you know, things surrounding a lot of aspects of tech, but part of that is the diversity data, both in terms of you know, gender, race, ethnicity, and age. Um, something that's interesting and that we did with the study is that we didn't stick with the standard definition of tech. I mean, defining tech is hard and it's nebulous. Mm-hmm. And I promise I am getting back to the gender piece. I'm with you. I'm fine. Um, it's, it's a nebulous term. And mm-hmm. um, if you look just at the tech industry, that's not telling you everything because Nashville is a great example. We have a relatively small tech industry, but we've got healthcare mm. and we've got tech workers working in the healthcare industry yeah. by the thousands. I mean, that's one of the huge, that's a huge driver yeah. of, of the tech talent that we have here. Um, so focusing on the tech industry isn't enough. So another way that you can look at it is focusing on tech occupations mm-hmm. um, as defined by like government sources. I won't, I, I could nerd out and get in the weeds on all the data sources. Yeah, but I'll give me NACE codes and all that I'll, stuff. I'll, yeah, <laughs> um, well, yeah. So the, the SOC codes for occupations, when we started that project, the first thing we did is we sat down in a conference room at the NTC and said, okay, <clears throat> let's look at the CompTIA report. Like what, mm-hmm. what occupations are they including? Mm-hmm. We want to include those so that we've got consistency but that isn't enough to represent the true tech ecosystem Mm -hmm. because tech is an ecosystem Mm -hmm. i mean you need it project managers business Mm -hmm. analysts you know data scientists software programmers dbas you know cybersecurity experts although these days everybody kind of needs to be (laughs) in the cybersecurity space um but you've got all of this. And so when we sat down and identified, okay, these are the 26 occupations that we're going to include, and they capture not only those traditional tech occupations, but also those occupations that sit at the intersection of business, of, mm-hmm. of you know, mathematics, with, you know, data science being the, the best example there, and, and crap capture um everything that makes Nashville special in terms of creative tech, you know, so like your graphic designers and your multimedia artists, Mm -hmm. um, all of that. So in the most recent report, if you focus specifically on gender, if you look at the top level numbers, you would, we can all pat ourselves on the back because we're, we're right at 40% female representation in tech, Mm -hmm. which You know, if the goal is to have your workforce match the population, Mm -hmm. then women would be roughly 50-50. In the actual workforce, it would be more like Mm 51-49 women 
women are actually more represented. Um, but you don't see that. But 40% doesn't seem that far off. So 40% was what you gathered from, you said the top number? From Yeah, when you look across Maybe. all 26 occupations, this is okay. over 65,000 tech jobs. Mm-hmm. When you look at the ratio of women to men, it's women who held 40% of the jobs. Gotcha. Men 60. Okay. Um, and so that that's a great number. And we could... That would be like, oh, we are, we're making progress. We're getting there. We're getting there. And and we are. We are getting there. (laughs) It's just, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Mm -hmm. Um, But where you really have to get into it is when you dig in and you look at the occupations Mm -hmm. separately because there is a high amount of variance in female representation across Mm -hmm. the, across the different occupations. Mm -hmm. You know, your marketing research analysts are like 60% plus female. Mm -hmm. Um, Software developers, it's around 20, which okay. is kind of, it's pretty consistent everywhere. Um, so it's it's really important to look at the particular occupations mm-hmm. um, to kind of get that more nuanced, nuanced understanding of it. Um, but our goal, I mean, the, the ideal is to achieve parity. Mm-hmm. And to have your your workforce look like your population. Yeah. And so the day that we hit 50-50 on gender representation, not yeah. just across the top, but, you know, across all the occupations, that'll be the day the work <laughs> is done. And I'm not sure that day is going to happen in my lifetime, but, you know, yeah. I'm going to spend every day chipping away at it as long as I got the energy to. So. No, I love <laughs> it. So, so what's the strategy? Is it is it to look at those individual occupations and say, hey, we need to boost up this software development space, you know, or focus on that versus, you know, something else? Yeah. OK. I mean, you, OK. It's. Now, we got too many women in this, these positions. And let's it, look over here. Exactly. OK. Um, you know, it's one of those things where. Um, I just totally lost my train of thought. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you're on so many boards. I know. Here. It's a lot. I get really excited. Just, there's so many different directions I could go in with it. And I want to go in all of them oh at my once. Um, I think that it's just a matter of uh, people come to me all the time and they're like people I don't know. And they're just like, I just want to let you know I read your report. And, you know, it, it, it changed me. Um, that happened to me with a guy at, at the analytics summit last year. This guy walks up to me and says, you know, I just want you to know that I I went to NSS because of you. Like I read your report and I studied and I looked at the numbers and, you know, I looked wow. at the skills and all this stuff. And, you know, it was really impactful mm-hmm. to me. Um, I've had folks in the corporate space say similar things and that they'll come in and say, you know, we had your report in a planning meeting where we're talking mm-hmm. about our, our hiring and trying mm-hmm. to figure out what our, you know, our, our, our DEI strategies need to be not mm-hmm. only to just hire, to, to hire, to identify candidates, um, to help us get closer to parity with what the population looks like, but also, um, understanding what the salaries need to be, to be competitive, mm-hmm. um, and that's that is tremendously rewarding. I wish I could be a fly yeah. on the wall in yeah. every room where those <laughs> conversations take yeah. place. Um, but that's how that's how I see the data making the impact. Right. Is it's yeah. my job to get the data out there mm-hmm. and you know help tell the story at a high level. But then different people are going to have different use cases for it and yeah. just doing everything we can to make sure that we're giving them something that they can well, find it, actionable. And it takes a lot of work too. I mean, to you, you put a lot of work and effort in to, you know, the report and, and gathering all that information and, and, you know, to, in order for it to have that impact in multiple organizations. So, you know, because every, you know, you, did you call yourself a nerd earlier? You said you could nerd out on something. I'm a right? total nerd. Okay, yeah. okay. Because I, I didn't want to call you a nerd. You were like, what? Yeah, <laughs> anyway. call no, but I mean, I'm everybody's not going to be a nerd, right? Yeah. So, so that's your thing. You're passionate about the numbers. So you use your skill set to develop that report along with your team. And then other organizations, you know, can have their impact where they have their skill set, you know? Mm-hmm. So I think it's really key. Everybody plays a part. Yeah. 
Uh, so it's it's uh, it's very fulfilling, I'm sure. And you know, to that end, I think that's <clears throat> one of the things that makes Nashville so mm -hmm. special. I mean, it's certainly true of our tech community, but I feel like it's true of our community as mm -hmm. a whole. Mm -hmm. That I agree. Here, there's a consensus that it's not about my company or mm -hmm. your company or my turf or your turf. It's a general recognition that a rising tide raises all ships mm -hmm. and that we are yep. all we're all focused on making an impact in our one area, mm -hmm. but we're totally open to collaboration and trying to find those places where, you know, at the intersection where we can we can complement one another and figure out like where we're doing things similar yeah. or, you know, so that we can make decisions. And one of the ways that WIT does that, um, that I think has, is really helpful is that we have ex officio relationships, board relationship agreements with both the NTC mm -hmm. as well as Blacks in Tech. Okay. Um, so that we sit as an ex officio board member on their boards mm -hmm. and the same, and they, they sit on ours. Yeah. And that's, that's a awesome. good way for us to collaborate and just know what's going on. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm very excited. This is still very much so an ideation, so I don't have a date or anything like formal for this. But our current director of membership and our vice president, Dana Ward, who was um, was the director of membership before moving into the VP role, um, reached out last week and we were like, "Hey, we have an idea. We want to. What would you think about doing like?" a job fair kind of event, but it's not a job fair, it's a tech organization event fair. And then mm -hmm. inviting folks, because we've been we've been bouncing around this idea of doing some sort of event for like folks that are new to Nashville, trying to get to know us. Um, mm -hmm. You know, like yeah. what, do we start a peer group? What do we do? And, and we're still figuring that piece out, but step number one is like, even those of us who are here, don't know everybody in yeah. the tech community yeah. and there are, there are lots of organizations doing amazing things and if we can get everybody in the same room mm -hmm. and invite people to come and learn more about the different organizations but also create an opportunity for those of us who are in those organizations to have even more conversations with the other folks and yeah. get more of an understanding and familiarity um you know, I mean, I, I'm I'm so excited for where. No, that's that's a, that sounds like a so. cool uh, cool idea, cool event. Yeah. Yeah. So keep us posted. Yeah. So what is the immediate goal right now for for where are you guys trying to grow membership or uh, put on cool events like this? What what what's around the corner? Right? Coming up next, at least. Well, I mean, we're we're always happy to grow membership. Yeah. One of our strategic <clears throat> initiatives right now is more. It's it's growing membership is great, but let's also really enhance the value mm -hmm, for mm -hmm. our members. That's a really big push for us right now. Um, we're looking at developing an online community portal oh, for cool. for our members. Mm -hmm. um, just and also just. Similar things, like we created, last year we created an onboarding champion process. Um, mm -hmm. Again, huge shout out to Dana Ward, our VP, because that was her her baby, so that we have WIT members who, when new people join, we actually reach out and say, hey, welcome. Yeah. Do you have questions? You know, basic things. Oh, like, that's, that's let's important. Just, <laughs> let's just make people feel welcome. Um, but it, but those things can be a more difficult lift when you do have an all-volunteer an all sure. organization. Mm -hmm. um, but really enhancing that membership value, we piloted a program. So we have two mentoring programs. We have mm -hmm. a collegiate mentoring program that's been around for a number of years. It started at Lipscomb. Um, we've now, we this year, we've got partners with four. We're with um, MTSU, TSU, Belmont, and Lipscomb mm -hmm. um, to have students there who want to be mentored, be mentored by mm -hmm. WIT members or or just folks in the community that want to be want to be mentors to them. Um, but we also have our professional program. Turns out, I mean, I didn't stop being a mentor the day I graduated mm -hmm. from college. We all need mentors and sure. sponsors through our you know through our entire um, our entire career. The matriculation of life. <laughs> yes. Indeed. Um, so we piloted a program last year exclusive for our WIT members of 
having that mentoring program where younger, early career, Mm -hmm. mid-career folks can be mentored by someone a little bit further down that same path. Mm -hmm. Um, And the pilot was a success, but that's where we're launching. We started recruiting both mentors and mentees for that program just this week. That's awesome. Um, Yeah. Those are, those are great initiatives, I know, because I was a mentor for the Elite program mm-hmm. at, in, with NTC. Yeah, yeah. And, and so my wife is an IT project manager, right? And and I always encourage her, you got to get out to these events. And see, I'm a big networker. I go to events, and she's like, I don't know how to network. I'm like, trust me, you know, people are going to love you. And uh, But I know she's been to, to some of you guys' events and, and some other things in the city. But I appreciate the work you're doing. We talked about a lot of meat, right? And, and I can tell there's a lot of substance uh, and value in the organization, you know, with all that you guys are doing. So uh, if you're not aware or if you were not aware of WIT, and now you are, and tell us how to get in touch with WIT or engage or learn more about membership. So you can always go to our website, uh, www. W-I-T-T-N, W-I-T-T-N dot O-R-G. Um, we are also on social media. We've got, we're, we're on all social media yeah. outlets. Under, yeah, cool. Yeah, Women in Tech Tennessee. Good stuff. Uh, I, I can see some great things coming down the pipeline. And it's really good to, you know, when I talk to folks who run organizations or are very involved, to see the structure, right? And the, like you said, the pillars and the values are really key and you know I can tell by your passion even though you call yourself a nerd I call it passion <laughs> <laughs> you know you're passionate about what you do right yeah and uh, there's some things I can nerd out about and be, you know but it's passion yeah. so um, I want to say thank you though for that for that passion and, and the work that you're doing I can tell you're super busy how many kids you got one just one okay okay one. how old is your he is, is um, will be eight okay in, this year <laughs> How did that happen? Yeah, I have, I have one human child. And <clears throat> wow, okay. A number of pets. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I, I know it's it's a lot because I have one son. He's thirteen, but you know, it, you know, I'm out here working and building a business and going to events and you know, being a mentor sometimes. You know, it's a lot. So a lot. it's uh, it can be challenging, but uh, we appreciate your work. You guys engaged with. W-I-T-T-N dot com, right? Org. Dot org. I'm sorry. O-R-G. Uh, so, guys, if you're not following the podcast on YouTube, make sure you do that. If you're listening to the podcast, go subscribe to the channel on YouTube. And, obviously, you can listen on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to the podcast. And, Amy, again, we appreciate you coming in. Thank telling you. us your story all the way from Mississippi. <laughs> Pots. What's the name of this town again? I forgot the name of the town. <laughs> Potts Camp. Potts Camp, Mississippi. Thank you so much. Thank you, Potts Camp, <laughs> for, for leading her to Nashville by way of Murfreesboro. All right. Good talk. Enjoyed it. Much success. Yes. Appreciate you. See y'all. Can't stop to lie. Won't stop to lie. Can't stop to lie. Won't stop to lie. Won't stop to lie. Won't stop to lie. Ain't no Just be smooth.